Welcome to topic 4, part 7, where we'll be looking at solid solution strengthening of metals. So remember our big picture, we've been talking about defects in crystal structures and ways in which we can modify the strength of materials by using defects to our advantage. In this part, we're going to focus on one of two remaining mechanisms, solid solution strengthening. We'll talk about precipitation strengthening in topic 8, or excuse me, part 8. All right, let's talk about strengthening mechanism number three, solid solution strengthening. First of all, a bit about solutions. There's this concept called solubility, which is a measure of how easily one element or compound can be dissolved into a second. So for example, water and alcohol dissolve each other completely. I can put as much alcohol into water as I like, and it will always dissolve and form a solution. Salt also dissolves into water, but it has a limit. At some point, the, called the solubility limit, you will not be able to dissolve any more salt into that water. And oil and water are immiscible, meaning that they cannot be dissolved in each other. They form a mixture, not a solution. So there's three possible options here when we mix two elements or compounds together. A perfect solution, a partial solution, and a mixture. Well, the same logic applies to solids. In a liquid state, the elements, nickel and copper, are completely dissolved within one another. And we have, two, we have one solution with two different elements. Notice that the nickel and the copper are randomly distributed within one another. There's no pattern because it's a liquid. Now when I solidify that liquid, I get a structure that has nickel and copper in it with the same orientation of elements. In other words, I have one crystal structure, in this case FCC, and the nickel and the copper randomly occupy lattice positions in that FCC crystal structure. This is a perfect solution, and it's actually quite rare in metals. Nickel and copper is one of the best examples. Much more common is to have a mixture, a multi-phase mixture of elements within the solid. In this case, I have two phases. The first phase is a solid solution made up of copper and zinc atoms, an FCC crystal structure of copper where the zinc occupies random lattice positions as a defect and substitutional impurity in this case. The other comp component in the mixture is or the second phase is a compound that has alternating copper and zinc atoms much like a MO2 or a M2O3 type of crystal structure that we saw for ceramics. This is what we see more often in metals and uh, is what we, we're going to use to help strengthen metals when we talk about precipitation strengthening. But first, I'd like to look at single phase solutions and how we can make metals stronger from single phase solutions. So here's a question for you to consider. Imagine you have a base metal of copper and you decide that you want to add an alloying element to it. Your choices are zinc, beryllium, nickel, and tin. And you can only add certain amounts of each one. 30% zinc, 1.8% beryllium, 30% nickel, and 25% tin. When you add these different alloying elements, you increase the strength from 69 megapascals for pure copper to a much higher level for each of the different elements, some higher than others. On the far right column is the ionic size of the various elements. The ionic size of pure copper is 0.117 nanometers. Zinc has an ionic size of 0.125 nanometers, and so on. The question is, why does the strength go up when I add impurity elements, and why does it go up different amounts for different types of impurities? And is there any connection between the radius or ionic size and the strength increase? I'll give you some time to, give it, to think about it. Okay, hopefully you've had some time to figure something out. Notice that when we add zinc, we get about double the strength of the pure copper. 
But also notice that the atomic radius of zinc is very close to that of copper. There's not much size difference between the two, which explains why there's only a marginal increase in strength. But compare that to beryllium. There's a very large difference in the atomic radii of beryllium and copper, and I only have to add a very small amount of beryllium to get a very large increase in strength. Nickel is another example similar to zinc. The radius of uh, nickel is almost exactly the same as that of copper, which is why it forms a perfect solution with copper. And the strength is only increased about two times by adding the impurity elements. And lastly, the addition of tin. Tin is quite a bit larger than copper, and we can add it in large quantities, up to 25%, and you can see that you get a tremendous increase in the strength of the copper when you do that. So, what do we learn from this? The important thing is that it's not how big the atom is that determines the strength addition to the, uh, when it's added to the impurity. What matters is the size difference between the host atom, in this case copper, and the impurity atom, in this case beryllium or tin. Those are large differences and therefore we see large gains in strength. Let's see how this works. Imagine we have pure copper which has a yield strength of about 10,000 psi or about 69 megapascals. When I add zinc, zinc has a small difference in atomic radius, and we see that we get very small change in the strength. The reason for this is that the zinc distorts the lattice very little. So as a dislocation travels by, it barely notices the presence of the zinc at impurity atom. If I add tin, I'm putting in a much larger atom, which distorts the lattice as shown in the picture. As a dislocation comes by, it interacts with the strain field surrounding that impurity atom and is repelled, much like in strain hardening, except this time the dislocation is repelled by an impurity atom. The dislocation is locked in place and can't move, which gives us the impression that the metal got stronger, which it did. And the same thing happens when I add beryllium, only in reverse. Now I've added a very small atom, which causes the same lattice strain, but in compression, or excuse me, in tension, and as the dislocation travels along, it also gets repelled by that lattice strain field. So the dislocation is once again blocked, and we have an increase in strength. This is why pure metals are always weaker than alloyed metals, and is one of the main reasons that we alloys, alloy materials. Now, we have to keep in mind that increasing composition isn't always so simple. If I change the level of impurity atoms, it can change the solidification behavior of the metal. In other words, I can change the melting temperature by adding impurity elements, and I can change what phases may or may not form when I go from the liquid state to the solid state. In fact, if I add too many impurities, a new crystal structure can form within the material. We'll see more about that.